Sarah, I'm so honored to be on, to be here. David and Walt and lots of other folks. Okay, so a little doom and gloom first, though. All right. So um, here's an outline of what I would like to talk about, and I kind of don't have to talk about the first topic. Thanks to Eric Rim, Frank Hu, uh, all of the School of uh, Public Health at Harvard. This idea of shifting from nutrients to foods and from foods to food patterns is hugely helpful. And we heard three of those this morning. We heard vegetarian, paleo, and Mediterranean. The problem with those is you can game them if you're an American. So as an American, uh, for going vegetarian, you can have a soda. For going paleo, you can go to McDonald's and ask for a hamburger without the bun. And for Mediterranean, you can put a jigger of olive oil next to your nightstand and swallow it before you go to bed. And honest to God, that's what Americans do, because those patterns are hard to define. So I think we need some more. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some things and have a little fun. I actually was changing my slides all morning listening to you guys talk. It was a blast. <laughs> One of the, I like the, the theme of common ground. And I want to tell you how much fun I had recently at the Institute of Functional Medicine moderating a debate between paleo, uh, Mediterranean, and vegan. And it was like a fisticuffs thing. So they all presented their studies, and they said, we're right, and you're wrong. And at the end, I said, so what do you guys agree on? I said, well, everybody agree we should eat more veggies? And they said, yeah, we should all eat more veggies. Everybody agree we eat way too much added sugar? Yeah, we agree. Everybody agree that we eat way too much white flour? Yep. So that was pretty good, because they actually said they thought 70% of what Americans eat has added sugar or refined white flour and that we eat way too few vegetables, but you can't make up the ground of the 70% just with vegetables. So then they decided, you know, what we really disagree on is the meat and the bacon and the sausage and things like that. That was black and white to some of them. And they really disagreed on the whole grains. Not just grains, whole grains, right? So that's where some of the contention lies. Now, I do want to build on this just for a moment. Who saw the New York Times Sunday Magazine just a couple weeks ago in this fabulous thing on wheat. Can we actually ask the questions about wheat when we don't really have available to us maybe all the fabulous types of wheat and tastes? And when we say whole grain, we don't really mean switch from Wonder Bread to a caramel colored thing that says whole wheat on it. We mean wheat berry salad, don't we? Well, I do, because I make a kick-ass wheat berry salad, just so you know. <laughs> so we could, for common ground, go to these three. But what I've been hearing again and again from some of the questioners, yeah, but what about behavior change? It's really got to taste great, and it's got to be available. So I want to tell you about an exciting study that I'm going to do that's going to get published in all kinds of places, and it's going to be useless when it's done, OK? I'm going to tell you again, this is the best study I've ever run, and it's going to be useless, We're sort of. We're com comparing low fat to low carb, I think, in a really innovative way. Go ahead and ask me later about it. Um, we're genotyping people, we're determining if they're insulin resistant or not, and we've got 1,600 fecal samples in the freezer right now, because we're not really looking to see if low carb or low fat wins. What we're looking for is a range of predisposition to different diets, because what we see every time we do a study is this range of response. So what if we can find that genetic metabolic microbiotic fingerprint to predisposition to doing better on one than the other? At this time, we are just about at the 8,000 pounds of weight loss mark in our study. And we have people losing 60 pounds on both diets and gaining 10 pounds on both diets, and everything in between. I can tell you the average difference will be moot. What will be really interesting is trying to predict or, or identify the variability responsible for gaining 60, sorry, losing 60 versus gaining 10. Um, I will say that we're really proud of our health educators. They go about this like um, bo all the health educators have to teach both diets with passion. And one of the health educators came up with this icon for our study. We are trying to teach the lowest, best quality fat diet we can come up with. We are trying to teach the lowest, best quality carbohydrate diet we can come up with. I sort of flippantly refer to this as vegan versus paleo. And we ask everybody to have a salad every single day. And both groups get as much vegetables as possible and avoid added sugar and avoid refined flour. Those are the three common things. OK, but when it's all done, it's a study. They're motivated to do this. Is the food going to be available? Are they going to continue to do this when we're done? Is it? We're not really arguing about health so much. So we call this thing, one diet does not fit all. Let's start. Stop bickering about which one is better. Let's embrace the variability that we see. 
So to really make change, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I'm going to call this health versus stealth. And I know I am going to regret the stealth thing. So let me make it clear. This is not a deceptive type of stealth, OK? This came about from a frustration of getting substantive behavior change and uh, having the opportunity to teach Stanford students in a class that a pediatrician named Tom Robinson and I created with a fabulous teaching assistant who came from a behavioral psych background. We created an undergraduate class called Food and Society. We had no scientific papers. All we did was popular books and popular food documentaries. It was fascinating. So we talked about animal rights and welfare, global warming, and human labor abuses in slaughterhouses, agricultural workers, and fast food workers as labor issues. And then there were no quizzes or midterms. They had to write op-eds and try to get them published. They had to blog. They had to do YouTubes for their peers. And we collected data before and afterward. And we got three other human biology classes to collect data on their dietary habits. And son of a gun, some journal published this dang horrible study, OK? <laughs> In this study, we concluded that if you dealt with issues other than health, you made substantive changes in your diet. If you made uh, you know, values-based judgments and connected your food choices to a lot of different values, you made changes. And so we have a bunch of categories. And we have, as all scientists must have, a graph and a p-value, OK? <laughs> Disregard, please. This is a ridiculous study. They self-selected into our class. They self-reported their diets. They had to put their name on the pre and the post things so we could compare them. And if they wanted a good grade, they obviously had to do the right thing. However, it was life-changing teaching this class for me to see how engaged the students were in these topics. To this day, some of them come back and say, that class changed my life, it's changed my career trajectory, and it's changed my eating habits. So I really don't care about the p-value. It's a horrible study design. I think the reason this got published is because it was a paradigm shift in the way we think of going about behavior change. So that's what I'm going to hang my hat on, the paradigm shift part. So I have a fabulous new postdoc from uh, Johns Hopkins from the Center for a Livable Future that got trained by Bob Lawrence. We're now doing um, as comprehensive as we can uh, an overview of what kind of food systems and food studies programs are cropping up all over the US. And it is happening. Student-driven academic programs, not about nutrition or ag or health or, or hospitality, but multidisciplinary programs linking the business, the legal, the education, the health side. This is where I think it's at, OK? So I think the solution to this behavior change, as much as I would like to have yet another 150 graphs about nutrients and milligrams of antioxidants and appropriate number of fiber grams, we've got to provide the food. And I have to say I'm frustrated teaching one individual after another. I really think they already get what's healthy. But it's the delicious part. It's the access part. So Walter and others, thank you for including me in Menus of Change, this fabulous organization where Harvard School of Public Health joined up with uh, the CIA that has their main uh, campus in Hyde Park. So we've had three annual conferences. These are really exciting. Um, there's also a CIA campus, Culinary Institute of America, in St. Helena on our side of the country. And Greg Drescher hangs out there. And we kept running into him more and more. And we said, why don't we, why don't we take this fabulous idea you have from a chef-centric point of view. You are trying to cha train the next generation of chefs to make unapologetically delicious food that find the intersection of human health and sustainability. I almost fell over that that's how we wanted to train chefs. But that is the mission. Honest to God, that's part of menus of change. If you see the 24 principles of menus of change that Walt and this whole group have put together, it's fantastic. It's really great stuff, but it's chef-centric. It's for the food industry. So on our side of the planet, over at Stanford in California, we created a university spin-off called Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. On October 26th and 27th, we had teams of dining service and faculty travel to Stanford for two days. And this group of universities has um, committed to collectively opening up their dining services on campus, partnering with academic faculty, 
and getting students to study the behavior of their peers and to use dining services in terms of thinking of procurement practices, chef-centric design for delicious food, and behavior nudging for those young adults that will leave college, have kids, and be CEOs, and be responsible for the food in their companies. This is intoxicatingly powerful. And I was stunned how all the dining service folks are into this protein flip. They're trying to put plant protein at the center. They're trying to do condiments of meat. They're tired of going vegan versus carnivore. Let's stop bickering. Let's have this fabulous world flavor fusion um, of different foods where we just have smaller amounts of meat. Let's not have meatless Monday. Let's have the whole week just be fabulously better tasting food with smaller amounts of meat. Then we don't have to bicker over these dichotomous things. So another systems approach to this, Jesse, are you looking? There you go. I hope that was a good picture of you. I came up with it right with you sitting right in front of me. <laughs> Is that your chicken coop in your yard behind you? That's what I thought. OK. So Jesse's been working with hospital food. I know a number of hospitals across the country that are really making dramatic shifts in their food. And you know who we get the biggest pushback from up front is not the patients or the visitors, but the staff. The nurses who want to work all night and have a Red Bull and a candy bar, because it's really hard to work all night. But there's a lot of hospitals that are engaging their staff in talking about the meaning of food in a place where the mission is health. So if this takes off and hospital food changes around the country, that could be huge. University food. We actually have a fabulous group of physician chefs at Stanford that are working on reimagining nutrition education medical school, which is a horrific gap in the educational process. We won't go there now. Um, for those of you who have seen the sustainability program guidelines from the CDC, so this crazy guy, God, why am I blocking on his name right now? He's so fun at the CDC, trained at Davis. Um, these are the guidelines they need to use at work sites where they feed federal employees across the country. And there is a whole section on sustainability in the CDC guidelines. There's standard and there's above standard. And these have to be followed in federal work sites across the country. And there's now some follow-up projects to see how well they're going. Can they actually source those foods? Do they find places to source them? What is the acceptance of the folks there? Do they need to do some iterative design work, not just impose it on them, but work with them? That's pretty exciting. I keep running into Junjo Lee, who works for the Hartman Group and advises the food industry. And her mantra lately has been, as she's warning the food industry, US consumers want fresh and minimally processed. That is the hot topic that they have to be ready for that's coming. And I wondered if you guys knew about her, but then I looked really closely at the slide I pulled off the web here. And it turns out she was a 2014 speaker at Old Ways. So we've got Big Soda on the way down. That's fabulous. Um, I don't know about you, but I am sort of a flexi-veganarian. I mostly eat vegan. I do have chickens in my backyard, so I eat my chicken's eggs. I did eat one chicken because Grandpa's dog killed Betty Boop, and we didn't want to throw Betty Boop away. So to honor her, Grandpa plucked her, and my wife cooked her, and I ate her. That was my first chicken in the last 33 years. But otherwise, I'm pretty much a flexi-veganarian. I've been so frustrated when I travel to go to airports, and I go past something that has vegan food, and I grab it so I don't have to go way over to my connecting gate and find out there wasn't any other and come all the way back. But now if I grab something right out of one gate and I walk to the other, son of a gun, there's like 12 places with better vegan food in the airport. Whoa, 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 university food, worksite food, hospital food, airport, Ooh, okay. And then we have some really interesting fast, cas fast casual things happening. Um, some of these are just West Coast. I tried to look up where all their locations are, but a couple of these are East Coast. So that's my talk. I, I think what's going on here, and I am truly excited about I don't know, Sarah, if we can call it American food, but something is happening on our campus, and not just on our campus, because these are airports all over the country. There's some really exciting stuff where we are connecting food to the environment, connecting food to values. And I hope, as a group, that's what we can come together on for consensus, and that we can figure out how to accelerate that and expand it to more and more places. Thank you very much.
excellent talk. It's something that we have um, discussed in our practice for quite a while as consultants in the healthcare and wellness industry as well. Um, and I've been writing about this on Forbes Tech for a while because what's missing so far that I've seen, this is an observation followed by a question, is we have yet to integrate technology into our food system in a way that makes it simpler for people to make the right choices. And as you're talking about the changing paradigm here in America, it's the plethora of apps and other ways that we can track ourselves that we haven't had before that help us make better decisions. So I'm wearing an Apple Watch. Uh -huh. I've had a job on up for three years. I've got just about every kind of food tracking and diet app that's available. And I'm still lost, <laughs> right? because there's still something missing, and that's what's great about what's happening here. And so if we talk about what, um, what David Katz talked about earlier, is when we went to the moon in the 60s, we had a mission to get there. And so if we look at what we're doing here, we need to understand what is our moon shot? What are we actually going for? What's our Apollo mission for this conference? What is it we're attaining? So can you can you give me a hint? Wait, wait, that's a that. question you're asking. Yeah, that's sort of me that you know, I'll give it back to you. And I'll then I'll, I'll be happy to. But yeah, you know, I, I think the theme has been nicely elucidated over the course of the day. Many of us come to this from the perspective of human health. We're, we're in preventive medicine, public health, we're in clinical disciplines. And so there I would say that the mission is nicely encapsulated by the, the conjoined cries of longevity and vitality. More years in life, more life in years. On the other hand, none of us looks forward to a future where we've eaten our children's food, drank our children's water, and have left them a ravaged planet. So increasingly, you can't have that conversation without thinking about environment, sustainability, resources. And, and so the prize becomes a bigger prize. It's healthy people, healthy planet. Beautiful manifesto recently in The Lancet, and I trust many in this audience are familiar with that. They're talking now about the Anthropocene, so you know, essentially the, the epic in, in history, geological time scales that is dominated by the influence of humanity. And so now, you know, if we want healthy people, we really have to start thinking about the health of the planet and the climate and all of that. So, you know, I, I would say the mission here is a narrow one. It's really to try and clarify what we know about diet that would lead toward those prizes. But I think it's all of those prizes. And, and then you know, I would agree, uh, my wife and I have been involved in an effort to share the recipes from our own family. And then the tagline to the, the free recipe site, business is love the food that loves you back. You know, I think those of us who have a sustainable, healthy relationship with food can love food. Right? It's not, not, you know, we keep having that joke, maybe you'll live longer, maybe it'll just feel that way. You know, I mean, nobody really wants to make that choice. The food can either be good or good for you, right? So I think the prize is more years of life, more life in years, a healthy planet, sustainable practices, and loving food that loves us back, right? So all of that was great. I, yeah, I wouldn't replace any of it, but let me build on it given the pr perspective that you brought. And so your readership is probably the quantified self. Absolutely. Right? Okay. So part of the quantified self probably rejects the idea that there's two food choices in front of me. One clearly looks like the food industry spent bazillions of hours and dollars making sure that dopamine receptors would fire it. And the other one is what David told me to eat. And it really looks good because that recipe was phenomenal. Both the food industry put their money into this one. Um, and they say that one will help me 40 years from now not have a heart attack. Well, it's not really very compelling. What about tonight? So I have to say that our, um, my research division, the Stanford Prevention Research Center, recently got some funding to create a well-being program where we're going to track 10,000 people in Santa Clara over time and 10,000 people in China. And we're going through a whole bunch of wellness outcomes, creativity, alertness, grit, um, stuff that you would feel at the end of the day. If you're in San Francisco and you're an information knowledge person and you're coding all day and you're too burnt out to play with your kid at the end of the day or you're really not getting that programming done that you want, but you are a quantified self-person, couldn't you be experimenting with some food? Um, one of the horrific things we have going on, on the West Coast is Soylent. You guys all know what Soylent yes. is? Yes. You're all old enough to know, some of you, to know what Soylent Green was? Yes. Yeah, it's just like that, okay. Um, so it would be really fun to do some new studies 
in the academic community focusing on real food and performance, optimal performance is really sexy in the quantified self group. I think if we shift our outcomes from disease prevention to optimal performance and use the quantified self, we could start a build on that momentum. No, that's a good emphasis. So you know, when I talk about longevity and vitality, I don't think of vitality as a deferred prize necessarily. I, I, I agree with you. you know, I'm thinking today, tomorrow, this week, and more productivity. So it's not just more years in life, it's more productivity every day, more energy, able to do the things you like to do. And I think many of us have seen that in ourselves and people we know, you know these end of one experiments. But, so I, I think immediate gratification can be part of the prize. Maybe it has to be. It, it absolutely does, in my opinion, having studied this and, um, for 20 odd years working in retail and luxury goods marketing, where all you did was try to figure out how to make that diamond jewelry or something look more appealing than anything else that you can spend your money on. So that brings me to the second question I have is we have this new shot, and let's call it better health, right? That's our new shot. We're trying to get people to live better because it's not a given anymore, right? We can't just assume that people are going to grow up and be healthy. There's too much in the way. And so when we look at our moonshot being better health, and you're talking about interesting behavior changes, then we really do have to name an enemy to this health. We've done a pretty good job of creating consensus around what we know is good for us, but what are the bad things? So what are our enemies? When we went to the moon, we didn't just go because we wanted to go. We wanted to go because the Russians were already starts, right? So who were we fighting against is the other question. It's not meat, and it's not vegetables, and it's not no. even grains. So what are we fighting? It's culinary illiteracy, and it's embarrassing. We really are so out of touch with food that we are willing to be like wheat in the wind that blows this way, and we'll go that. Tra uh, margarine, <laughs> butter, oh, any, oh, the new, oh my god, what's the th newest thing? Bulletproof coffee. Okay, <laughs> let's do that. Um, you know, without a sense of, okay, we ate like this for a thousand years and it worked pretty well, and now somebody's got some crazy ass idea, and we'll just go with that. No, 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 we are culinarily illiterate. Right, but you're, you're talking about something a little bit different, so I totally agree. You know, we, it, we the, at the interface of medicine and the media, we treat science like a ping pong ball. This study, that study, this study, that study. Where a serious scientist say everything we knew up until yesterday, the new study, let's add that, let's consider it in context. Does it change anything? Does it tweak what we thought we do? And then let's wait for the next study, the next. So that, that whole issue of information literacy with regard to health, I think is an enemy to public health advance. But I think, Gene, if I understood your question, you're asking who do we define as the enemy we want to overcome and dispatch, right? So the, the aspirational prize, Years in life, life in years, immediate gratification, vitality this afternoon, more productivity this week, and a healthy planet to bequeath our children. But who's the bad guy in this scenario? And I don't, I don't know for sure if we do need one. You know, again, uh, Dean's comments about fear not being a motivator. I mean, maybe this is different. I mean, maybe we really do like good versus evil. So the prize is the good. But I, I think we have a lot of people rising up to point a finger at evil. I mentioned Michael Moss earlier. His name's come up. So. You know, it, Michael is not the first to describe big food machinations that are sabotaging our efforts to be healthier, right? I mean, the whole bliss point concept, and I trust most of them are familiar with this, but a you know, Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist has told us most of the really big food companies have, have teams of PhDs whose job it is to make sure that when they tell us that you can't eat just one. That it's a very safe bet, you know. And they use functional MRI scans to back it up. Well, I would say, you know, that willful engineering of food to maximize intake as opposed to contribute to health and vitality, that's an enemy. I think people have pretty much rallied around the concept that big soda is an enemy. I mean, you know, more and more people talk about soda as the modern age tobacco, right? And, you know, it's just empty calories that's being peddled to us. And Coca Cola recently attempted to buy our understanding of energy balance with the whole. Gavin debacle, which again I trust is familiar to many in the audience. I, you know, I, I don't know if, if we need to define an enemy. It's an interesting notion. Do you agree with that? That that was. Well, I'm going to push back to my original comment. I think the problem is when we pick an enemy like that and then we bicker because it's such a slippery slope. After soda is Red Bull, is Gatorade, is fruit juice, is Kool Aid. Oh my God, the the potential enemies are endless. Okay. But culinary illiteracy is really just something with it. It's part of our culture. So it's something that has contaminated our culture because we've moved away from food and here's an opportunity 
to get back to it, to eat mindfully, to have less stress in our life. I would like to pick us an enemy that we fight that's within and not outside as a potential way to avoid some of the useless bickering that we get stuck in. So I was intent I'm not sure that it works, and it won't work for everyone. I want to say for a lot of the food things that we have, these days I feel like we need a hundred answers. There isn't one answer. So if, we, if this is one of the enemies to address, is culinary literacy or food illiteracy, I would so like to move there. So it's not any entity in the food industry, but our willingness to be vapid about our relationship with food. And I, there is an argument there. I, I've long noted, for example, that the very same people who will watch reruns of The Honeymooners to laugh at the foolishness of get-rich-quick schemes, for which only Ralph Cramden would, would make a grab, uh, those very same people who know that get-rich-quick is, is a scam and somebody trying to sell you something, and Ralph is a doofus, and he will never stop driving the bus, and Alice is always right, those same people are perfectly willing to reach for their credit cards when offered get thin quick, get healthy quick, look beautiful quick, be ageless quick, right? So, you know, in some ways our culture needs to grow up. And, and maybe the first step to cultivating that literacy is to acknowledge health of ourselves and our planet is something we all need to take seriously. We need to respect it. We can't seek advice, you know, from any huckster trying to sell us something. We need advice from serious people who've actually done their homework. And I don't think people fiddle around with their money the way they feel around with their health, right, for the most part. Maybe that's the issue with yeah. the enemy and it is us. I, I had a question for you, Chris, unless you have another two. Oh, I'll hold. Go ahead. I just, to sort of juxtapose your commentary with Boyd's, you know, again, at the end of all of this, we've got to take the pearls and, and string them here. Yeah. So, you know, the, the and, and I've really appreciated your work over the years where you've looked at some degree of genomic profiling and responses to different diets. The, the paleo perspective in particular focusing before the diaspora out of Africa, you know, we have a common ancestry. Uh, our genes are, are largely conserved, the ones that seem to matter most. So, you know, is there a case that there is sort of this fundamental theme of intake of food dietary patterns? And, and how would we define theme? that's good for the species. And then within that theme, there are variants on the theme that work best for individuals based on their particular endowment, you know, given genetic polymorphisms and such. Are you thinking that way? Or is it either or? And, and just to characterize this further, I've had conversations over the years with people like David Heber, who I think is almost willing to say we really shouldn't have dietary guidelines for Americans because dietary guidelines should be for each American. And that, to me, seems too extreme, but I'm interested in your perspective on that. Well, so, I mean, the, the place where I am scientifically right at the moment is just not running from the variability now, but embracing it and trying to, trying to find ways to get at that, because it is fascinating. I mean, I have some really heartbroken people come up to me and say, you know, I tried to do everything my doctor said, I tried to do everything the guidelines said, and it backfired on me. I tried the opposite of what they said, and I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you this, but I lost weight, my lipid profile is up, my energy is up, my alertness is up. I must be doing something wrong. I feel horribly guilty. <laughs> and they, they can't be this. It's, it's got to be part of the probability that we carry with us. And part of the way that we interpret it, too. So part of untangling that is assigning or, or giving them some guidelines. And again, having them game it. In our, in our field of nutrition, it's very hard to follow up. Are they really doing what we said, or did they find a way to do it differently, and they're telling us that's the name of what they did and it's not working, which is why I think if you go back to some of these simple values of food literacy, right. you wouldn't get so messed up. Look, it was local, it was seasonal, and it was moderate portions. Gene, can, can the media handle that? If the message is, you know, again, so how we define theme is part of the challenge here today and tomorrow, but if, if there is a theme of healthy eating, you know, we both agree, minimize blow in the dark foods, for example. Right? I mean, there's some easy things, right? Um, but, you know, the best diet for you is the best diet for you within that theme, and maybe you can discern something from what's worked for your family, or maybe you want to have your genome profiled by folks at Stanford. Uh, can we get past what seem to be a plethora of either or choices in the media when we talk to the public? I think we're actively propagating that illiteracy, right? Because the questions are over. It's not as if you know you can have a basic human healthy eating and tailored to you. It's as if 
guys will be hyper customized, so don't believe anything they tell you about that in your guidelines, right? I mean, that's kind of how we roll. Can we fix that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what the probably the next step after another day of really understanding everything that we know, which is basically what's happening here, we're kind of getting a really good understanding of everything that we know, and the common themes are surfacing. And the next step is always what is the value proposition that we create out of this whole consensus that we'll build? And part of that, again, when I said enemy, is probably not necessarily an enemy, but who are we competing against? Mm. You know, we're, we're competing against m and Mars and Cheetos and, you know, Cheez-Its and all the little goldfish crackers that my daughters want all the time in their lunches, right? We're competing against things that are highly appealing on a lot of levels that we aren't competing right, right now. And so right. if we're going to compete on that level, we have to understand that all the consumers are looking for is an easy way to make it happen. And so in our practice, what we've done with some the leading healthcare um, health systems in the country is figure out how to help them simplify their prescriptions to the patients so that it's easier for them to follow. Because, I don't know, 10 years ago, I went into my doctor and she says, oh, by the way, your cholesterol is 201, your triglycerides are uh, 247, and uh, you're overweight. Well, I just had a baby, so okay, I'll give you a pass on that. Um, but, and I said, so what do I do? And she said, well, you can, you can go on this, you know, cholesterol lowering drug, um, but you'll probably be on it for the rest of your life, or you can eat better and get some exercise. That was her prescription. I got a little more detail about eating better. I'm supposed to stay on, you know, leafy greens, eat oatmeal in the morning, and avoid anything white, white potatoes, white flour, or white bread. And that's all I got. That's all I got. And so what's happening is there's a massive disconnect between, and it's, it's even more obvi obvious when you're talking about academic research and actual um, application of such studies in, in the consumer world. And so what we're looking for as consumers are answers that make sense. And if we look at what we can come out of this conference with, it's a really good value proposition where we position every diet style that we're talking about here, all of which have great benefits. And again, it talks about the, the many choices that we actually have as, as consumers. And then we say, unlike things that are glow in the dark and that are highly sugared and that, and that um, you know, are processed and are bad for the environment and are bad for us health-wise, these systems themselves provide these kind of benefits. And so if we can generalize in a massive way and create, I don't know, a stamp of some kind that says no matter what it is, if it has this stamp, we know it meets these five or six or seven criteria, and I'm pretty safe if I go in there and I try that meal or I try that diet. All right, thank you. So I see we're almost running out of time. So I would love to jump in here and just say, I think this gets back to social norms and food systems. That's why I'm really excited about this right now because who, you know, as much as I hate to admit it, we really aren't cooking that much, but we're getting a lot of food that chefs make for us. And we can only cook the food that people make. So if we grow food differently because the demand is different, and if chefs are willing to cook it differently, we get prepared food in the grocery store, we get prepared food at work, we get a lot of prepared food. The chef community seems on board. They actually want to jump in and make this delicious food so that they're buying it from the right place. They're producing it the right place. If right. you counted up the 50% of meals you had that were prepared for you this week, and they were different than what they were 10 years ago, social norms would start to change, and that would become more of the default. That's what I'd like to see. Well, I'm noticing that the color on the screen now looks like it ought to be part of your tie, which is <laughs> best. Uh, but we'll take two questions, David and Mark. Chris, I'd very much like to have done your course. Um, I think that, that sounds to me the exciting thing. And perhaps it gives a paradigm for the way forward as to how we can convince the rest of the world. In other words, what you put together is a, is a, is a course which was interesting, exciting, and varied in covering the whole spectrum. And maybe that's, in fact, the approach that we have to use, something that is interesting to the public, exciting in a way. I mean, Boyd has said that the excitement that he gets uh, from, from the paper, but I'm just saying that the excitement you can create by putting in the environment, the abattoir, the whole, the whole thing into the story, and then people get a, a picture of exactly what the food is. That's your food education, I assume. It is, yeah. It's a systems level approach, and for the students, it's an exciting and innovative perspective other than just eat more healthy. 
and a good answer, I mean, you know, Gene started out really, what, what, is, what are we aspiring to? And I, I think you, you, you know, help make it be about something bigger than the way the conversation is typically framed. Meyer? Just a comment on the uh, personalized uh, approach, which uh, obviously there's tons of variability in any, in all weight loss trials, you always see some people benefit uh, with weight loss, no matter what the intervention is, uh, the cap diet or low fat, low carb, anything works for some people. Um, but uh, it's a little bit harder to apply that. Uh, so, so for weight loss, you can try something, and if it doesn't work, you try something else. And that will also hold for, for markers like uh, cholesterol or uh, hypertension. Uh, but it doesn't work uh, for long-term chronic disease. You can't try something and see if it uh, helped prevent your Alzheimer's and then go to something else. So while I believe that in the promise of uh, personalized approaches for uh, prevent dietary prevention of chronic disease, I think it's, it's going to take a while before we get there. Thank you. Good comment. We're now deep in the red zone. Yeah. Thank you very much.